So last summer, I got an email from Dr. Klein saying that uh, a few years had gone by since the med students had had any information in their other years on neuropathy and he was going to be teaching a class and he had asked for a, a few of us to come out and share some personal stories just to make the experience for the students and bring it home and make it more real for them. And so we did that and on that day I said to Linda, I said, we've got to see if he'll come out and talk to us. And as we were leaving, he actually came up to us and said, I'd be happy <laughs> to come and give a talk at some point. So we're really excited to have him here today. Um, he is an alumnus of the Keble College in Oxford. He was a graduate of the Westminster Medical School, University of London. He completed his neurology training at the U of C, and it was followed by a fellowship in clinical neurophysiology. Dr. Klein is the clinical neurophysiologist active in the EMG clinics, which is the electromyelograms, and the EEG interpretation, which is the electroencephalograms. He is also a participant in the Calgary Stroke Program and the General Neurology Clinic, Alberta Health Services. In addition to his clinical studies, Dr. Klein is actively involved in clinical research primarily through the Stroke Program and the Stroke Prevention Clinic. But he also evaluates patients for research studies in clinical neurophysiology. So he's going to give us an update and a review of, about what's happening in the medical world of neurology and neuropathy. So please welcome Dr. Gary Klein. He sent me an email last night and he said that he hopes that this talk will be interactive. So he's open to having questions and having a discussion. So, well, I mean, please stop me if you have a question. I'm not making anything clear. So, um... Stand closer to the mic. Okay. <laughs> Might even hold it. Is that better? Oh, yeah. no. Okay, so I can make this work. Not so far. <laughs> Push down on the bottom. Yeah, the bottom of that little black square. Okay. Why don't we try this? There you go, that works too. Okay. Yeah, you actually have to press it. Okay. Oh, okay. No, it's not going. Oh, it's not going. No problem. So, uh, because I'm linked to the UFC, I have to have all these slides first. So, I have um, no relationship with any commercial uh, companies or interests. And every slide here has been approved for copyright by the UFC. Uh, which means they, they can be looked at and reproduced, but it's not used for commercial purposes. So you can take photographs of them if you want. So um, what I thought we would do today is just go over uh, what causes peripheral neuropathy and then review some of the treatment options and maybe try and hit some of the highlights from the past few months of new research. And then I'm not sure what, what time we're supposed to finish, but if we have questions about genetic neuropathies, about exomes and genomes, all that kind of stuff, we can raise that at the end. And that, again, is something that's very, very new and, and trendy. We have until about 2.30, 2.45. Yeah. Well, I don't intend to talk two okay. hours. <laughs> so, um, so what I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about things like carpal tunnel syndrome or traumatic nerve injury or any of the um, inflammatory neuropathies that's sort of three or four different lectures all by itself. Um, and of course in neurology we always have to have at least four names for everything. So peripheral neuropathy is the same as distal symmetric polyneuropathy. And if you see that abbreviation DSP, that's the one they're using in all the recent papers. Lens dependent, I'm going to explain what that means. I'm going to explain what axonal neuropathy means. These are all terms that we use interchangeably. They mean essentially the same thing. So the basic concept is that there is something that is causing a problem with a nerve cell and neuron. So in the case of neuropathy, there are two types of neurons that we're worried about. One is the sensory neuron, that is in the dorsal root ganglion, and I have pictures of this later, or the motor neuron in the anterior horn. So these are cells that sit 
in or beside your spinal cord and then send a fiber called an axon down to wherever it needs to work. So the sensation from your big toe, you feel it in your big toe, it travels up a fiber to a cell body by the spinal cord and that's the longest axon in your body. So the bit of the cell body, when the cell gets sick, the bit of the cell body furthest from the, the cell itself dies first. So it dies back from its most distal point. So symptoms start in your toes and work back from there. So this is the motor system. And when I want to reach out and pick something up, what I do is I start off in the front part of my brain conceiving of that concept and I tell cells in here, in the motor system, to activate my muscles. The way it works, left side of body, uh, left side of brain, right side of body. So that message then goes down from the brain through the brain stem, crosses over, and then travels down the spinal cord to a cell here. So this is the anterior horn cell of the motor system. So when peripheral neuropathy makes your muscles weak, the disease is starting here and the muscle that's furthest away, the muscles that move your toes, will start to feel weak first. And this is just a schematic. So this is the anterior horn cell. This is the axon going all the way through the nervous system to the muscle. And on the sensory side, the information is coming up here from your toe or anywhere else in your body. And the, the cell lies just outside the uh, spinal cord and that's called a dorsal root ganglion cell. It doesn't matter what it's called. So it's sitting in the spinal fluid just outside the spinal cord. So when this cell gets sick, the most distant part of its axon gets sickest fastest. And that's why numbness starts in your toes and works up. So this is called a stocking glove, distal sensory neuropathy, external neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy starts here, by the time it gets to your knees, it starts in your fingers. By the time it gets to about here, it starts here, because these nerve fibers are starting in the back and coming around your body like this. So this is the most distant part of your body from the nerve cell is right here. And that's actually called a cuirass distribution. Can you say where that is because I can't see what you're pointing to? So it's right here. I can't see that. She's blind. Okay. It's right in the middle of your chest. Ah, okay. So in the front part of your chest, right down the middle. Thank you. Can you get up into the optic nerve? Because one of my MRIs came back that the eye doctor sent before and said I have peripheral neuropathy as well in the, um, in the optic nerve. So the optic nerve is actually not a nerve. It's, it's part of your brain. Um, so you may have a problem with a nerve that resembles a peripheral neuropathy, but by definition, it isn't. So there are 12, supposedly 12 cranial nerves, 12 nerves that come out of your brain and go to different parts of your body. But the first one is, go to, is the sense of smell, as cranial nerve one, and that's not a nerve either, that's part of your brain. And the optic nerve and the back of the eye is actually an outpouching of the brain um, that develops as your an embryo, and it, it's, it, you, by definition it's not a peripheral nerve, and you can't get peripheral neuropathy. You get neuropathy of the nerve, but it's not a peripheral neuropathy, it's a, a different cause. Wow. So optic neuropathy? Optic neuropathy is, is a disease of the brain, not a disease of peripheral nerves. So it, it's, a, it's a very unusual to see peripheral neuropathy and optic neuropathy or optic neuritis together because optic neuritis is a feature of MS, so um, classically. There are other causes, but so almost everybody in this province with optic neuritis has MS or some other cause that's damaging the brain itself or the eye itself. Will you have the slide up? Does this join, like I had asked Sylvia at one time, like my neuropathy seemed to pass my knees, almost up into my waist, yeah. so will 
your hands and everything meet somewhere? I mean, I guess hypothetically it could, but it, okay. it almost never. By the time it gets up there, it takes a long time usually okay. to travel up to there. But there are certainly people who have numbness yeah. of all four limbs and significant numbers of their chest wall as well. So that means another question, is all peripheral neuropathy progressive? The longer you have it, the worse it gets? It, uh, it depends, right? So if you have a disease that can be treated, um, then you can arrest it and even improve it slightly. So, I mean, the vast majority, we'll get to that in a second, but the vast majority of people with neuropathy are diabetics. And so if you treat diabetes very, very strictly and carefully, then the neuropathy usually arrests, and it can, in fact, improve. What about chemo-induced So then you poisoned the nerve on purpose because you're treating a cancer. So usually the, the neuropathy is worse after the treatment, and then it can improve or it can, more often it just stops getting worse, but it certainly can improve. Doctor, I'm sorry, I've got diabetic neuropathy, so does that mean if I get my blood sugars in really good order, I'll start feeling better? So, uh, diabetes is always tough because the, the evidence that it will improve is limited, but it, it can. So if you treat the diabetes carefully, it stops getting worse, and then it can improve in some people. But it's not, I'm afraid nothing is ever guaranteed, but it can. So what about idiopathic climber? I, I don't have diabetes, yeah. I've had all the blood work done, but I find my symptoms are getting worse, like over time, I've had it for five years now. So I've had a progression and I notice lately it's getting worse. So, I mean, I know there's dietary concerns and other things that, that I've read on our, on our website, but. What's your take? Because I, I, I see a progression the wrong way, unfortunately. Well, I mean, if there's nothing to treat, there's nothing to treat, unfortunately. So we're going to get to all the numbers in just a second of, okay. of the percentages. But about one in five, even if you look as hard as you can, about one in five, you never find a cause. And they do tend to be progressive because you can't treat something you haven't found. It just doesn't mean there isn't a cause, it just means we don't know what it is. Right. Yep. Um, I have, I've been told, and I've got papers that say I have optic neuropathy. Now, I know mine was caused through lack of blood flow, therefore lack of oxygen, yeah. to the optic nerve, and yeah. you're saying that's part of the brain. How common is that? Well, in, in my world, it's quite common, because I do stroke every Thursday. So, okay, um, so we're connected with that type of thing. Yeah, so, um, ischemic optic neuropathy is, is a feature of stroke basically it's basically a stroke because the 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 blood supply to the eye comes from inside the brain mine um, was total heart block during the heart operation yeah sure but same, same so thing, it, I guess. It, it's basically a stroke right so it, the, the, the problem is that because they call it the optic nerve they call the disease of it optic neuropathy but it, it's not really a neuropathy it's in the case of your case it's a stroke wow. basically didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and, and in other cases it's something else, but it's just not a neuropathy. Okay, thank you. Okay, so in the nerves themselves you'll see different types of fibers. So there's large and small sensory fibers. Uh, the large ones, when they get sick, they cause numbness. The small ones cause, in particular, a lot of pain. They can cause some numbness too, but the painful neuropathies are all because of a small fiber neuropathy. They also cause this autonomic features, so things like bladder and bowels are controlled by small fibers, so they can get disturbance of bladder and bowel function. And motor axons cause weakness that starts in the toes and works its way up. However, almost everybody with a true distal symmetrical polyneuropathy will start off with numbness in their toes. And that's the hallmark of this disease. So this is just so, because this is the lower motor neuron, not the upper motor neuron, and we put the brain is not involved, this is a spinal cord neuron, you get muscle uh, weakness with wasting and, and sluggish reflexes. That's just a technical point, I think. So the next question I always pose to the medical students is, 
rare disease, common disease. Are you guys the only people in Calgary with this neuropathy? Well, let me answer that question for you. Um, so, this accounts for more than 10% of all neurology appointments in the city. Remember, there's about 60 or 80 of us seeing 8 or 10 people a day, so do the math. Um, the commonest disease of the peripheral nervous system, at least 2-7% to of everybody, and more than 10% of people over 60 have this. So, a very common disease. And one of the commonest, there's, there's lots of common diseases in neurology. This is one of the top four or five. So, a very common entity indeed. So, to define it, is, there's a lot of confusion about definition. So, this is called the Toronto Consensus, and it's a, a few years old now. Obviously, Canadian consensus, but adopted worldwide. So, all all you need is two of the following. Neuropathic symptoms, which means pain or numbness in your toes. Numbness on physical examination in the dist uh, distal extremities. And absent or decreased ankle jerks. So that's all you need to define this syndrome. So, now I thought I'd just go and talk a little bit about numbers. Um, so, this is just one study, so every study is different. Um, so this was done in uh, Texas, in basically the town of Corpus Christi. Um, and this was uh, about 5,000 patients evaluated and 458 included in their study. Of these, 80, 4 out of 5, 80% were given a specific label, which means that 1 in 5 weren't. Um, most of those were made by family doctor, those diagnoses were made by a family doctor, not a neurologist, but about 15% had complicated cases that needed a neurologist. And in this study, remember it's just one town, one study, number one cause by far was diabetes. They have alcohol down here, but alcohol certainly is a much higher percentage in my practice than chemotherapy, B12 deficiency. This is uh, pabonemia, it means an allergic reaction, it's sort of a antibody-driven disease, quite unusual in my practice. But uh, realistically, of the people we diagnose, the vast majority are diabetics. So, um, 2017, 9.1% of the US population is diabetic. So if you take out all the kids that wouldn't be diabetic, or very few of them would be diabetic, that's a lot of people with diabetes, almost 30 million people, and of those, almost half will get peripheral neuropathy. So a very common disease indeed. So, treatment is always based first on treating any underlying medical condition. If it's diabetes, um, then you treat the diabetes. If it's alcohol, then you have to stop drinking. If it's something else, then you have to try and find a cause that you can treat. B12 deficiency, give them B12 and so on. Um, there is no treatment for numbness. Um, nothing at all we do will change that. So, from a, my clinic perspective, from our neurologist group, it's all about pain management. And about half of the diabetics will get painful neuropathy. So, do the math. 30 million diabetics in the States, half of them have neuropathy and half of those have pain. That's a lot of people. So even if you divide by 10 for Canada, that's still an awful lot of patients. So, when I was preparing this talk, I sort of did all the next sections. That first part is stuff that I've taught before to medical students. But the, all the rest of this is, uh, is all new that I've been looking at the last few weeks. And so I asked myself, like, what is the best treatment at any rate? Treat patients with pain every day, literally. And what proof do I have that my treatments work? And that turned out to be kind of disappointing, I have to say, <laughs> when I got right down to it. And the reason it's disappointing is for all of these reasons. That we're talking about hundreds of thousands of Canadians with pain to feet. And most of the studies involve a handful of patients, 
30 or 40 or 50, 60 people. The duration of the studies is anywhere from two weeks up to a few months, but the vast majority are four, six, eight, ten weeks. So a very short duration of treatment for a chronic painful condition. About a quarter of the patients seem to respond just to the placebo arm, which is, means that you're only dealing with 75% of the people you thought you were dealing with. The definition of success is reasonable. It's between 30 and 50 percent reduction in pain. Again, it's over a short term, not over the long term. So, the the commonest drugs we use are drugs that we use to treat depression. Um, they are used usually in much smaller doses, so they tend to have far fewer side effects. And by far, the, the commonest ones that the neurology uh, group uses are these two, amitriptyline or Elevil and nortriptyline or Aventil. A lot of the GPs use this drug, duloxetine or Cymbalta, because these two drugs tend to cause dry eyes and dry mouth, so the side effect profile is a bit better. And this drug, effects or Venlafaxine, is also very commonly used. And then the next big group of drugs are the drugs we use to treat seizures. And this drug, pregabalin or Lyrica or Gabapentin, are by far the commonest that we use. And then the next commonest would be valproic acid. It's called Epival sometimes. There's lots of different names, trade names for these drugs. And then um, quite commonly we use creams. So the one that's been around for a long time is capsaicin. So all this is, is, is pepper. It's pepper ground into a cream. And you smear it on the bit that hurts. And it blasts your pain fibers. Um, and then it numbs them. And it works for some people. And there's a bunch of other creams out now. But the commonest one now is a compound cream that uses gabapentin. And other than gabapentin, one of the anticonvulsants. So a lot of the... Uh, and the pain patients come in on the compound cream now. So opioids. So this is what's called a systematic review. So all that means is that somebody at some university somewhere decided they would look at all the papers on narcotics and come up with a conclusion. So it's a reasonable thing to approach, but this is just, again, the, the opinion of one group. And I'll explain why there's a, a better way of looking at things in just a second. This was systematic review found that opioids, that the, those are things like morphine, those class of drugs, codeine, all the narcotic drugs, um, had found no evidence of long-term benefit, but a very high risk of abuse, addiction, and overdose. And to be honest, that would be my experience too, that if you start giving people morphine for their pain, no matter what causes the pain, a very high proportion of people will need more and more morphine because the drug becomes less effective over time as your body adapts to it. So to get the same pain benefit, you have to use more. And you reach a level where everyone starts to get anxious about prescribing them. So there's been a big push away from opioids for most of the chronic pain conditions, not just neuropathy, but certainly including neuropathy. And it's a very difficult area for many people. So this was the, the hot topic quite recently to combine nortriptyline and gabapentin. So nortriptyline is antidepressant and gabapentin is an anti-epileptic we use for pain. And it was widely used. I've used it many times myself in combination. So I thought, well, let's go back and look at the original paper. 47 patients in total of whom would expect 25% or 12 of them to respond to placebo anyway four weeks of therapy. So four weeks out of a lifetime of pain. And the average doses were these. So a big dose of gabapentin and a uh, respectable dose of nortriptyline. So whether or not that works, I think it's hard to say. But I was, when I actually went back and read the paper myself, I thought, gee, am I basing my, <laughs> my prescribing practices on 47 patients looked at for four weeks? And that, unfortunately, is, is a big problem with all of these trials. So, 
let's start hitting a hot topic. So, in the last, I mean, marijuana's obviously been around a long time. Um, it says in the literature 5,000 years, I'm not sure who went back and discovered 5,000 year history, but anyway, it's been around a long time. It was introduced by this guy into Western medicine. He was working in India, in the old British Raj, and he started using marijuana for his patients. Widely used all through the late 19th century, along with other drugs like opium and cocaine and so on that were very widely used. Um, but they all became unfashionable in the 20s and 30s during the time of prohibition, and they were all banned uh, throughout the West, based largely on prohibition, in fact. So, just in the past few months, we've been, at least, the medical profession has been bombarded by advice about marijuana. I'm not quite sure why, because it's been legal to prescribe it for a long time, and there have been medical marijuana clinics around, certainly in Vancouver, for decades, and in Calgary for quite a few years. And by July, we will just go to the corner store and, <laughs> and buy our, our marijuana there. But so anyway, we've been bombarded by information, so I thought I would share some of it. So this is what I meant. This is what's called a Cochrane Review. So these are, um, I think they're from Massachusetts, somewhere in the north, northeast of the U.S., that actually do uh, very organized, systematic reviews. Um, and they looked at um, cannabis-based medicines for chronic neuropathic pain. And what they do is they go through all the studies. They only look at what's called randomized controlled trials. So they, what they do is they select patients randomly who come in with their pain. It's up to about the trials now. And half get the drug and half get either another drug or placebo. And they try and match up the two halves. So they sort of draw a line this way through the audience, half get the drug and half don't. But you'd make some effort to make sure that people are matched by age and gender and illness. So it would be, all be diabetic neuropathy, about the same number of uh, people of the same age in each group. If you have too many young people in one group, that would sway things. So these are much more thorough systematic reviews. So this is brand new. It was um, performed in November of last year and published just March 7th, just a few days ago. And they found in total 16 randomized controlled trials, a total of 1,750 patients, so about 100 and some patients a study, which is actually bigger than most of the pain studies. The duration was anywhere from two weeks, which is not a very long time, up to six, uh, six months, but most of them fall in the middle for eight or 12 weeks. <coughs> and they used um, different ways. So there's nasal sprays, there are pills, and then inhalation, of course, means smoking marijuana. Um, so different ways of supplying the drug. Um, 15 versus placebo, and one against this drug here. So this is a narcotic dihydrocodone. It's commonly used for post-op patients. Um, in some ways, I think this is a bit unfair because you should compare a painkiller to another painkiller, I think. But anyway, that's what the studies did. They looked at uh, marijuana by itself. And then, because this is what's called a cock and review, they looked at what's called study quality. And then they look at the number of patients, the duration of the study, how good the, the groups were in terms of being equal and so on. And they found that two of the studies weren't very good in terms of how they matched up patients. And 12 were okay and two were pretty good. Um, but overall, probably moderate quality studies, which is not bad for pain. When they do this, yeah. the other day I was working on a study, one of those reduced studies yeah. on nutrition. And the guy made a very intelligent comment at the end. He says, I have not investigated the bias. In other words, follow the money yeah. as to who is supporting all the studies, yeah. which sometimes can be quite telling. Yeah, absolutely. So you're talking, I think, mostly about the drug company studies, where the drug company will say, we have a blood pressure pill. So unfortunately, we the university. But the university was being paid a lot of money so that I could do the study. And we were, we were certainly very encouraged to do those kind of studies. Um, 
And over the years, we realized that that bias was, was a very negative thing. And we had much more, at the university level anyway, we have much stricter controls. So that it's a completely sort of hands-off relationship now. So we can ask the companies for certain things, but we can't, we can't take it out for dinner or pay us salaries, all those kind of things. And that, that, that's because of that fear of bias. Not so much that, that we'll fudge the results to please the company, but more because, you know, if the drugs all do the same thing, and we're being paid by one company to promote their drug, that it'll give it a skewed view of what that drug's value is compared to the other drugs. But no, it's a very valid point, and that's what the Cochrane does. It looks at all that stuff, right? So if it says Cochrane review on it, you can believe what it says. Have they done literally 100,000 studies? Or I, I, I doubt if it's that high, but well, they do a lot. They do a lot. They're reviewing other people's studies. Yes, no, absolutely. And they do it on every topic, right? So it's not just neurology, it's gastroenterology, surgery, obstetrics, whatever. So they do, they do reviews of everything. And they probably do, I, I, I couldn't tell you, obviously couldn't tell you, but I would be guessing they'd be doing hundreds a year. And um, then, so if it says, if we'll just go back to that first slide. Um, as soon as you see this, I think you can be much more confident as compared to just somebody in a, somebody in a university doing a review may doing a very good job, but if it's a cock in review, and the reason it's good is because of this slide. They look at each individual study and rate it as low, moderate, or high, and they explain in the, the review exactly why this is high and that's low. And is Cochrane the only group that's doing that? I, and again, I couldn't tell you the answer to that. Okay. It's the only group that I, who's I read that stuff, and I don't read anybody else's, but oh, yeah, there, may, there may be other people too. But it's, it's one of those names, you know, it's like stuff on the Mayo Clinic, right? If it, if it says Mayo Clinic on it, it's probably going to be okay. If it says Cochrane on it's probably going to be okay. And it's because of all the rules they have to follow. So, um, their conclusion was that cannabis probably does work, in terms of pain relief and in terms of reducing pain by half. But there are more adverse effects, things like sedation and dizziness and so on. So Cochrane gave it a sort of a qualified thumbs up. So is that THC or CBD or combinations? So um, this was all of the randomized controlled trials using any form of cannabis. So, the THC. so this was smoked, this was a pill, and that was probably, I would have, I didn't read the individual what pills were, but probably it would have been THC yeah. and nasal sprays. But, so every randomized controlled trial of cannabis that they thought was good enough to be included. So they did not include sort of unrandomized trials. They wouldn't include sort of papers that were clearly just written by the industry or whatever in any of their trials. To get into a Cochrane review, it has to be a randomized control trial and done by a recognized researcher and so on. But I, I, they did actually say in the review, and I can't remember, I don't have it with me, um, what the drugs were, the active ingredients were. They were all different. I, I don't know enough about cannabis to tell you the difference between the different types, but this is all the randomized trials. So, qualified thumbs up. So, this is a different group. Um, so, this is an Alberta group, and it's called Top Alberta Doctors. So, so I can be part of that. So, <laughs> this, I believe, comes from the University of Alberta, um, and it's sent to me, uh, well, not just to me personally, but to every physician in Alberta, who I think who belongs to the AMA, which is the Alberta Medical Association. So it, it doesn't come directly from the AMA, but through the AMA channels. And they look again at, at all therapies. Um, so it's not just neurology, it's every discipline. And it's not just cannabis. 
And it just so happens that this came in my email two or three days ago, and, and cannabis is one of those hot topics everyone's talking about. So they looked at every therapy that we've just mentioned was on that list, duloxetine, nortriptyline, and so on. Um, and for every therapy, they put down 25% as being <coughs> sort of placebo benefit, which I think is a bit misleading in the way they present the data, to be honest. But of all their therapists, they ranked amitriptyline, which has been around forever, and the world's safest, cheapest drug, or one of them, as the most effective, uh, working about half the time. And cannabinoids were actually listed as the least effective of all the drugs on that list. So, um, we'll see what happens. One of the things they did was document all the side effects of cannabis, but mostly they were the ones you would expect, sedation, confusion, all that kind of Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we'll see how that's gonna work in the future. Okay, so that was the, the stuff about pain, so I'll stop here and ask for questions. When you think about cannabis, as a pain in Siberian uh, Well, uh, I, I have never prescribed it, and I've never used it, <laughs> so I'm, I'm probably not the best person uh, to ask. I can tell you, I, I see about eight or ten neuropathy patients a day, so probably about, uh, because I, I do stroke as well, so probably about 20 a week, and about many of them, half of them probably have pain. And, and many of those pain patients are using cannabis already as medical cannabis. Um, and they all, I mean, I have never spoke to anybody who stopped using it. They all, seem to, <laughs> I mean, they all carry on using it. And I, and I think come the summer when you can just walk down to the store down the street and, and buy some, it's going to be much more widely used. Yeah. Um, that's a different, that's a different <laughs> strain of cannabis. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know very much about it other than that I know there's a hundred different types. And um, the stuff you're going to be able to buy commercially is just the regular stuff that the teenage kids yeah. smoke, I believe. And the, the, the medical cannabis that was around uh, ten years ago was a pill. Um, and it was very expensive. It was hundreds of dollars a month. And I, I don't know about the, the Alberta uh, dispensers, but I don't mean, BC, you can go to a medical pot dispensary and they just give you pot, like just the stuff that you buy off the street that you smoke. It, it's not a pill. The edibles. And the edibles you and everything. You can go to any farmer's market now in Vancouver and they're just set up tables everywhere. It's, there's, yeah. 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 It's very but, different than here. Yeah. yeah. But even, like, I haven't been in Vancouver for at least a year, but there's pot dispensaries everywhere. Oh, yeah. you, you walk around downtown. And there's all, and the, the stuff that I've never, never bought anything there, but I know people that have, and you, they've shown it to me, and it's just like pot, like in a little bag, like they bought it off the street, right? So. From the patients you see, can you see any uh, progress or progression that have been using it? You mean in terms of pot? Yeah. But I mean, it, I mean, it's purely pain control. It doesn't do anything else. It does not reverse or halt the neuropathy. You're just treating the pain. With all of these drugs, in all fairness, if I write a prescription for Elevel, I'm not treating the numbness or the neuropathy. I'm trying to reduce the pain and give people a decent night's sleep, and that's all I'm doing. And, and that's with any kind of pain thing, that's all you can do. Thank you. But isn't uh, pain and it causes all kinds of problems too. Right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, with gabapentin and Livica, which is pre gabalin the common side effects by far are sedation. And people will tell me, I took one pill and I felt like a zombie. I can't take any more. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a very common thing in my practice. So, that, that other one would be better? But, um... Well, amitriptyline is, is an antidepressant. It's not the same class of drug as, as gabapentin. So when would you choose an amitriptyline versus a gabapentin? So what I usually do is I start off with a low dose of amitriptyline or nortriptyline because it's sedating. So you take it at bedtime. So even a tiny dose like 10 milligrams will help people sleep. And typically in a small fiber neuropathy, 
the worst symptoms of at night. People lie awake with their feet on fire mm -hmm. and they can't stand the bed clothes on them. So I saw a low dose of uh, Elevil, usually because it's the cheapest, the easiest to find, and build it up. And by the time I reached 30 or 40 milligrams, I added in the gabapentin at a low dose. Bearing in mind, I'm basically on a trial of 47 patients, right? So, um, you know, I'm just, you know, yeah, it always makes you think, is that the right thing? But it works, I think, for the majority of the people I treat. So, uh, is the uh, gabapentin is for pain and uh, numbness? Yeah, no, no, none of these drugs treat numbness. There is no treatment for okay. numbness. Because when you have numbness, it implies that the nerve ending is gone. So it's not reaching your skin, so you cannot treat that. So if you have more numbness and sometimes pain, what does it mean? Well, I mean, that's just, it means, clinically it means that it's a large fiber neuropathy, not a small fiber neuropathy. It's a different type of fiber, but the bottom line is, unless you can treat the disease that's causing it, you can't treat numbness. So gabapentin will do, but the... Gabapentin will not affect the numbness at all. Uh, but what if you got both? So, if you can only treat... Numbness in my feet, so let me walk, yeah. but the bottom, if I step on a little stone, it hurts like hell. So you can treat the pain, but not the numbness. Yeah, and, and like I get uh, at night, I get like my feet ache. They don't burn like you're talking about yeah. fire. But it, like I, you know, I feel like rubbing them just to get yeah. pain away. But you can take that away. Yeah, absolutely. So you're treating the pain, you're not treating the numbness for sure. So most of the time.